Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, or even good evening, if you might be in the other side of the world. Susan, my coach, and I are here to talk to you about how to step off the blame game. Hi, Susan. It's so good to see Hi. you here. Thanks for being here. Yeah, it's so great to be here with you today. Welcome, everybody. Uh, so we always say recognize that you can see us and hear us by just putting a comment in the chat. That would help so much. Yes, that would be a big help. Before we talk about how to step off the blame game, we want to make sure somebody's listening. Because Susan and I already talked a little bit about it beforehand. So we kind of know how to step off the blame game. But do you know how to step off the blame game? So if you are here with us for this Facebook Live and we are broadcasting live, let us know. Hello, we are live. Thank you. We see and hear you. Perfect. Yeah. That's great. So glad you're here. Tell us where you're from. Give us a little intro. Your Hi, Megan. Good afternoon. So you're not from the West Coast. I see that by saying good afternoon. You are at least having lunch or something close to it at this time. Uh, Susan and I were talking about what we were doing this morning. And so Susan's on the East. Are you East Coast time? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, so I'm, I'm California time, even though I live in Arizona. Arizona's weird with their time. So it's still breakfast time, and I haven't had any. Good, Indiana. Well, welcome, Alabama. Welcome, welcome, all. So the question we want to ask you, what is the blame game? Like, what is the blame game? Do you know what it is, and do you play it? <laughs> you know, it's not like, do you play Monopoly, or do you play yes, but do you play the blame game with someone in your life, maybe your kids, maybe your spouse, maybe your parents, maybe your neighbors, or your friends, do you play the blame game? And what's your part? Are you more the blamer or are you more the blamed? What part do you play and do you play the blame game? Hello everyone from South Carolina, from Pennsylvania, my own stomping, old stomping grounds, Maine. I've only been to Maine once and it was so beautiful. Were you there for there, Susan? No, I've never been to Maine. Uh, I went to, to Bear Harbor and Acadia Forest and oh, it's so beautiful, I'd love to go back. All right. Bree says, I blame myself and my ex. How do you play the blame game? And how, what's the player you play? Are you mostly the blamer? Or are you mostly the blamed? Let's talk about the blame game today. All right. Do you play the blame game? Ah, oh, we've got somebody from South Africa. Welcome. Welcome. I've never been to South Africa. Have you been there? No, I haven't either. Again, I would love to. Yeah, me too. I love to travel. I would love to visit all these places. Yeah. Andy says, yes, I am guilty. I tend to assume responsibility, blame for everything because I want to fix it. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm from Chile, but I'm living in Michigan for nine years. Well, Susan, you live in Michigan. So that's yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe you haven't even thought about the blame game, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, maybe you're not even tuned in to that happening, but it happens. Mm -hmm. Leslie and I were just talking. It happens all over in our culture and our world people trying not to take responsibility for ourselves. And so maybe you're just starting to think about this and how it might impact you or where it might show up in your life. Yeah, some people are saying they play both sides of it. And Kelly is from North Pole, Alaska. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, wow. Kelly, give us a temperature report. <laughs> are you seeing the Northern Lights right now? Is it like 100% 24 hours a day light time there? I know that when I was in Siberia, Russia, I was there in July and it didn't get dark until 1130 at night. It was the weirdest thing. It was just like the very short window of night in the summer. Um, so honored that Leanne is here with us. Leanne is one of our coaches and she's here. I tend to take all the responsibility working on that. Okay, so we're getting a sense of, yeah, you identify. You're playing the blame game sometimes in some ways, right? And some of you may be taking all the responsibility. So you're just ripe for a good blamer. Because if you're going to take responsibility for my well-being, I'm going to make you do it. I'm going to blame you for all of my troubles and all of my heartache. Everything I'm angry about is your fault. Because if you're going to fix it for me, then I can just sit back and watch you try. And then I can criticize all the things that you're not doing right. Right? So if that's the way you want to play the game. And you're the one who takes all the responsibility for the other person's well-being. Uh, they're going to let you. And they're going to like it because then they can continue to blame you when you don't do it right or you don't do it enough. We don't do it the way they want. Right. What else? Yeah. My ex blames me for everything, even though it was 95% of him causing the breakdown of our marriage. Okay. So when you take that responsibility, it is my fault. I somehow should have known better or fixed it or done it or solved his problem with anger or solved his problem with infidelity or solved his problem with his own mindsets issues or whatever it was, even your kids, 
mom, it's your fault that I didn't get my homework done. Oh, right. Yeah, it's my fault to remember for you. It's my fault to bring your papers home, right? These are things that happen all the time in our families, right? Or we blame other people. It's your fault. I'm so mad. If only you would have done what I wanted, I wouldn't get mad. Mm-hmm. Right? And so we're, we're just... On my end, Leslie is frozen, so I'm not sure what you're all seeing out there. Let's see if she comes back. All right, so if you can still hear me and you can't hear Leslie anymore, that's kind of what I'm picking up in the chat, perhaps. Um, I'll just kind of pick off up where she left off until she can come back in. Um, you know, we're talking about what is the blame game and how do you play that? Uh, and we see that in our culture so much, uh, even in parenting. Um, she was just saying, you know, how we respond to our kids. You made me so mad. I yelled at you because you didn't listen. You didn't obey. Um, but we see in adult relationships as well. Um, So, you know, talk to me a little bit about uh, what is the benefit, perhaps, of playing the blame game on either side, if you're the person who is doing the blaming or getting blamed, what might the benefit be in, uh, in this loop, this cycle of the blame game? What might the benefit be? Uh, maybe it's, oh, it goes back to the garden, Amy says. Yes, we saw that, right? In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve uh, pointing fingers. Uh, whose fault is it? And uh, yes. Yeah, we don't have to resume, res, um, assume responsibility for ourselves if we blame someone else. Yes, is that a benefit? For some, it might be Uh, maybe preserving our pride. You feel more in control? Yes. Yeah, the chat is going so fast. I hope you're all interacting with the chat and reading it. Um, Great answers here. You don't have to make changes. Yes, if you blame somebody else and put the responsibility on them, yes. You can cause them to do the changing and not have to do the work yourself. You can be lazy and disengaged. Yes. Yeah. What is the cost? What is the cost of blaming somebody else? What does it cost us to not take responsibility, to be lazy, to be disengaged? It's definitely easier. Yeah, the cost might be that we fail to grow, that we lose uh, relationships. Yeah, somebody's saying strained relationship. We lose ourselves. Yes. Resentment and anger. Absolutely. Yeah, recognizing our part is very important in this. Uh, you know, it puts we have to take responsibility for ourselves in order to change and grow and be healthy people. And this is sometimes really difficult to do. So how would you step off if you find yourself in that loop with somebody and perhaps it's a destructive person in your life who um, doesn't want to change the pattern? If you're in a healthier relationship, you might have a discussion about, hey, I noticed what's going on here. Um, And you might be able to say, uh, you know, in a situation where they're blaming you, oh, is that my fault? How are you seeing this as my fault? Um, And they may shift, they may begin to uh, examine themselves. 
But if you're in a relationship with somebody who's more destructive and they really don't want to take responsibility, they don't really care about being healthy, um, that's not going to shift, right? Um, you're, you're just going to keep in that pattern. So how do you get off if somebody else doesn't want to shift the pattern? How do you step off? Yeah, let's see it. Any ideas? Yeah, asking those questions. Yes, first recognizing what's happening, recognizing the pattern, recognizing any steps you've already taken to shift, which might be asking those good questions, uh, having boundaries. Absolutely, Leanne saying, pause. Yes, I love that answer. When you pause, you can recognize what's happening. You can recognize the pattern. And then you can make a choice. Do I want to continue this? Whether you're the blamer or the blamey. Um, do I want to continue to uh, be disengaged? Do I want to continue to try to control the other person? Or do I want to take responsibility for myself? Or do I want to continue to be the victim? Do I want to continue to try to fix somebody else? Or do I want to shift and do something different? So once you can pause and notice what's happening, then you can decide, what do I want to choose here? And so the choice might be um, taking care of your own well-being. Ah, oh, Leslie, we're back. I know, our internet went completely down. We had to restart oh. everything. And you know how tech is, and me and yes, tech. Yes, I do. <laughs> so that was, that was a good experience for me to <clears throat> practice what I've been practicing, which is not let what's going on in the outside world wreck my peace. And that was a good opportunity for me to actually practice it. <laughs> and me as well, because all of a sudden, <laughs> Leslie <You're> vanishes. <laughs> So, Leslie, we carried on without you, um, and we were talking about, um, you know, what are the costs and the benefits, so we had some good discussion in the chat, and then we were talking about the steps. How do you get off? Okay. How many of you want to get off? <clears throat> like, how many of you want to stop being the blamer? And you can't stop the blamer, so if he's going to blame you or she's going to blame you, you can't stop that, but how can you stop taking the bait? Now, can you stop taking the bait? So the first step is what? What do you think you need to do? Yeah, we've already had a little bit of discussion on this and some great ideas in the chats about recognizing and pausing. Yeah, so I think once you recognize, oh, here we're playing this game, that's power, right? That's power. That's so once you recognize you're playing the game that you don't want to play anymore, I want you to picture this. Let's play that you're, let's picture, Susan and I were talking about this today. Let's play that you're, picture that you're playing tug of rope. Okay, remember that game as a child? So one side is on one side and one side, but this side is stacked. The blamer is always much stronger than the blame, right? <laughs> so, so you're playing tug of war, the blame game, all right? And you're just trying to say, no, I'm not, you're, it's not my fault. And they're saying, yes, it's your fault. And you go, no, it's not my fault. And they go, yes, it's your fault, right? What could you do if you wanted to stop? playing the game. First, you have to recognize this is going nowhere and I'm probably going to lose. So what would you want to do if you wanted to stop? Because the cost is too high. Your fingers are getting burned. You're getting stressed out. You're getting angry going back and forth. You could just let go of the rope, right? You could just let go of the rope. I'm not playing this game. I love that visual. There's so much power in just releasing that and saying, I'm not playing. If you're not holding on the rope, there is no game. Yeah. If you're not arguing back, if you, you know, so here's where you have to come to an acceptance. You're not necessarily going to stop the blamer from blaming you because you can't control what he does with his end of the rope. All you can do is not pick up your side of the rope and accept that responsibility, right? Don't, you know, you can just, even if you don't say it out loud, you can just say, 
you know what, even if I am to blame, I didn't make dinner the way you wanted, or I didn't cook dinner the way you wanted, I'm not to blame for your reaction to that, to your feelings for, about that, to the way you're handling yourself about that. So there might be smidgens of truth to the blamer, you know, that, well, you didn't make me happy, or you won't have sex with me, or you won't do what I want. Probably he's right in some ways. So understand, we're talking about these beliefs that we have, and we're having a webinar on Thursday, a workshop to talk about these beliefs that we get so caught up on, but he has a belief or the blamer has a belief that life should always work out the way I want it to in order for me to be okay. That's what I was challenging. God called call me to challenge it. Life doesn't work out the way you want. My inner one went, went down, right? I could blame whatever internet company we have. I don't even know Starlight. I think all. We could blame that. We could blame my computer. I could blame my husband who didn't set it up right or who didn't clear the cookies or whatever you're supposed to do before we start. I could blame, but that's saying everything is supposed to work right for me. And that's just mm -hmm. not real. That's not reality. That's not living in truth, right? Things don't go right for us all the time. And the blamer has this mindset that you should always do what I want to make me happy, or you should always make me happy, or you should never upset me in any way. Who can live up to that? Who can live up to that? right? And so if you're struggling with some lies or some beliefs that you have, you may want to sign up for a seat at our free webinar on Thursday. It's this Thursday. We're going to do it twice, once at noon like this time, and another, and I promise we will make sure our internet's going to work because I'm going to be the only one on there. Um, and then we're going to do another one at 730 at night, but you have to sign up to get a seat because it won't be on Facebook. It won't be anywhere where anybody can just access it. You have to be invited by signing up and you will get a special invitation to go to those links. Also, you're going to get some videos ahead of time that will give you some teaching in preparation for the webinar, because there's so much I want to share with you about this, that, you know, if you want to learn it, I want to give it to you and it's totally free. So you'll get four videos plus an hour of webinar on this time. And I would highly encourage you to show up because I will spend an hour afterwards or two to answer all of your questions, which is a much more private site than this public Facebook page. So that if you do have some personal questions that you want to ask about all of this, some of the lies that keep you stuck and feeling miserable in your marriage because you're being blamed all the time and your church is telling you that, hey, you just have to do more and try harder and keep praying and keep this marriage alive at all costs, suffer for Jesus. All these beliefs that we have that I'm selfish if I don't and I don't want to, I'm bad, I'm not spiritual. All these beliefs that we have that may not be true. And the blame game is part of all that because someone blames you, you accept that rope because you believe, oh, I must be responsible for your feelings. I'm responsible to make you happy. I'm responsible to never upset you. That's not true. But if you believe that, I'm not saying personally go out and purposely provoke someone. I, you may do that too. But even if you do do that, let's say your kid, I remember when my 16 year old was provoking me, he was just being disrespectful. You know how 16 year old boys can be toward their mamas? And he was being disrespectful to me. And everything in my flesh, wanted to do what my mother would have done. And what she would have done is she backhanded me right across the mouth. And that's what I wanted to do. Now, I didn't do that. But I wanted to, right? I wanted to. But I did say some icky things. I didn't curse, but I just started playing the tug rope game. I started yelling and blaming him for making me unhappy as a mom. And he was blaming me for making me unhappy as a kid. And we were going back and forth a little bit. And he stopped and he goes, and you're supposed to be the Christian counselor? Wow. <laughs> and they bait you, they bait you, and then they can attack and accuse you when you get baited. And I got baited and it was a really powerful lesson for me in that moment that as long as I was participating in the sin, he couldn't see his side. And so uh, once I showed up in a way that said, you know, I see you're unhappy, but there's nothing I can do, or hey, I'm not gonna play that game. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna grab that rope or I'm not even gonna listen if you're gonna talk to me this way. It was much clearer who was the sinner and who wasn't the sinner in that moment, right? And so when we just jump into that, because we believe we've got to fix this, or we, you can't talk to me that way, or I'm not going to allow it, we get caught into the mix of sin just like they are. And then we're both playing the tug of rope game, whether it's the blame game or it's some other game that we're playing, right? And you don't want to do that. That's not who God calls you to be. And so we just highly encourage you to do your work. And part of your work could be attending this webinar on Thursday. So if you haven't gotten your seat yet, please join. It's absolutely free. You get these four videos, probably take you about 
two hours to watch the videos, about a half an hour each, 20, 20 minutes each or so, on some four lies, just so that you're ready when you come to the webinar with really understanding what the Bible says about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I love that you are so generous with this because it's really good teaching at no cost, right? I, I've attended your, your webinars before and there's so much valuable information and that um, question and answer period afterwards is sometimes... Uh, the most engaging part of that is to really um, hear what other people are struggling with and the real questions that you're able to answer in real time. I love that. So attending live is really important. Thanks. For you don't want to miss that. Yeah, you don't. And if you can't attend live, it's this Thursday, August 18th. We'll do it two live times. I'll do it once at noon, just like now. It'll be about the webinar will be about 45 minutes long. And then I will stay another hour, hour and a half. Sometimes I've stayed two hours answering questions. I know you have. And then we will do the same thing live again. No recording. I will be there on live on the evening time, 730. So sign up for one of them. You can come to both if you sign up for both. But what I want you to do is attend. Because if you don't attend, you will get an abbreviated replay. But it'll just be of the webinar. And you will miss two really important things. First thing you're going to miss is you're going to miss the community. Just being in this chat on our public Facebook page, we have found over the years that being on this chat for women has been life-changing because all of a sudden they realize I'm not alone. I'm not crazy. There's other people who are stuck like I am. There's other people who have been told things that I've been told that aren't true. I don't feel as isolated as I once felt when I didn't know that. But you will see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women on the webinar who are there because they're in destructive marriages and they're in perhaps conservative churches that have told them things like you just have to die to yourself and mm -hmm. all the things that sound good and sound spiritual, like God hates all divorce. But is that really true? Does God hate all divorce? And we're going to talk about that at the webinar. So if you don't show up live, you won't have the interaction of the chat with other women and you won't have the opportunity to hear question and answers because we don't send that for the abbreviated replay. So all you'll get is an abbreviated replay of the content of the webinar, which if you can't come is, is certainly worth your while. But if you could show up live, I mean, if you were going to a counseling session, you'd show up live, right? You wouldn't just record the counselor talking to you. You would show up live so that you could get what you needed from that information. If God has brought you to this ministry and you're new to, to what we're teaching here, and you're in a mess of, of a situation with your relationships, whether it's with your husband or your children or your parents or your boss or your girlfriends, and you don't have good relationships or you feel pretty taken advantage of or you don't know how to set boundaries, all those kind of things, then come to this webinar on Thursday and you will learn how to build some internal muscles, just like I have been building so that I didn't flip out when my internet went down and all I saw was black which is tempting for me because I'm and maybe it's happening again. I don't know. Maybe put in the chat. It's Leslie uh, frozen for you. And are you hearing me? So um, I see some questions in the chat. This is not going to be on Facebook. You will receive an email link to join this webinar if you sign up. And you can see that it's posted right below here, lesliebernick.com forward, forward slash join webinar. Um, so enter that in, just plug that in and just register for either the noon time on this Thursday, the 18th or the 7.30 and those are Eastern times. Um, it's going to be great value. Like I've said, I've, I've sat in on these webinars with Leslie before, and she gives some really quality teaching at no charge. Um, and, uh, you know, bring your questions. And she's very interactive and very generous with her time um, in answering all the questions. Uh, so if you're, if you're engaged in this chat and you're getting some information about the Blaine game, uh, please show up, sign up for this webinar, and I will be there in the chat uh, probably at some point during both times. Thank you, Leanne, for confirming 
uh, that you can still hear me. So I'm just going to maybe go to some questions. I know Leslie and I both have a hard stop today at 1 p.m. So I want to make sure that we can address um, in the chat uh, the questions you put. It's easy for me to take the blame when anything goes wrong with my kids, my work, my husband. It's my way uh, to, to being sympathetic. How can I still be compassionate without taking the blame? Well, I think you do just that, is that you, um, you can understand that somebody might be disappointed, they might be sad. Um, so really kind of engaging with them. It looks like that you wanted something different, um, but I can't solve your problem. Or perhaps um, encouraging them to resolve their own issue by asking some questions. What could you do to help yourself now? I can see you're disappointed with the outcome. Um, so I think this will help the other person to grow as well. Uh, not only is it good for you, but it's good for other people. Um, if you're talking about, uh, you know, kids, that's for sure, is that they need to learn to mature and be responsible adults. Uh, you're also saying in your work and with your husband, they're already adults, but perhaps they've gotten in this pattern of not managing their own life. And so it's time for them to learn that. Um, so I think you can offer some compassionate words while still holding that boundary of not stepping in to fix it. Um, I'm gonna take another question. I'm hoping Leslie comes back. I, I get totally in trouble with hearing her talk and being engaged, um, but we'll continue on without her. Uh, I'm so hard on myself. I blame myself for everything. If I was just smarter, more godly. If I was just a better, better mother, I always believe it's me that is flawed. How can I know the difference between being humble or really taking more than I need to? That's a great question. Um, how do you know the difference? I think these skills that we had talked about earlier, um, just taking a pause and recognizing what's going on and, and getting honest with yourself. Is this about me or is this about somebody else? Am I taking on something that belongs to somebody else? Um, so I like, uh, you know, Leslie brought in the imagery of the tug of war. Um, I like to think about this in terms of uh, wearing a backpack. Um, and what are you going to put in your backpack? Um, so uh, other people may offer you things that they want you to carry because it's too heavy in their own backpack. And so they'd rather you carry it for them. And so you have to ask yourself, do I want to take that? Do I want to carry that for somebody else? Or is that theirs to carry? You can only fit so much in your backpack. And uh, if it's too weighted down, you're going to start harming yourself. So really looking out for yourself and taking care of yourself means being really choosy about what goes in your own backpack and what you're carrying around. I'm so glad you're back, Leslie. You just keep going, Susan. <laughs> I'm like, ah! Yes, I don't want to have dead air here, but we definitely miss you when you're gone. Um, so I was just answering a question, the second question that you might see on your prompter about how do I know the difference between being humble and really taking on more than I need to. So maybe you have some thoughts about that. Let me just look at the question. What's the difference between being humble and taking on more than I need to? Yeah. So, so this person is saying she's really hard on herself. She blames herself for everything. If I was just smarter, more godly, if I was a better mother, she always believes that's her. That yeah, first of all, better. that's not humility. <clears throat> so blaming yourself and beating yourself up, please don't confuse that with humility. Humility is accepting your limitations without beating yourself up. Like it's understanding that I am an imperfect, fallible, limited human being and I'm okay with that, right? So I am gonna make mistakes and I'm not gonna know everything and I can't fix everything and I can't make everyone happy. That when you accept your limitations as a fallible, limited human being, and you're not God, you can't be Superman for Superwoman for your kids or your husband or 
God and know their thoughts and know every need and fix every problem. You, you can't do that. So why are you beating yourself up? Because you can't. So understand that true humility is being okay with being human, right? It's being okay with being human. Beating yourself up is not being okay with being human. Francois, <clears throat> Francois Fenelon, one of my favorite old guys, if you read old <laughs> statistics from the 16th century, said this about this. He said, go forward without letting yourself be touched by the grief of a sensitive pride, which cannot bear to see itself imperfect. Mm -hmm. Right, go forward without letting yourself be touched by the grief of a sensitive pride that cannot bear to see itself imperfect. So perhaps what you're confusing with humility is sensitive pride, right? Mm -hmm. Humility and pride, you know? And so to be able to say, wow, if I could be okay, just like a dog is okay with being a dog. A dog doesn't try to be a human and they don't beat themselves up because they can't talk and they can't do certain things. Dogs don't do those things. They just are happy they're a dog. You know, they lick their butts and they don't use toilet paper and all the things that we <laughs> would not want to do if we were a dog, but they don't care because they're a dog, right? And they accept being a dog. Could you accept being a human and not try to be God? And if you aren't, trying to be God, then why would you beat yourself up for not being able to be God and fix every problem and do everything right and right? So don't try to be who you're not. Just be okay with who you are. And if you make a mistake, humility is hmm, made a mistake. Can I make it right? How can I fix this? It's not, why did I make this mistake? And why am I not enough? And why am I not good enough, right? So when, I, when a sensitive pride person marries a blamer, boy, he's mm -hmm. got someone who So I think here we are again with Leslie Frozen. I, I wish I could finish her thought, but I'm not sure exactly what she was about to say. But I love that quote and the distinction, distinction she put out there about uh, having a sensitive pride. And we can all have that sometimes. I think recognizing when that's happening and beginning to discern um, when that is, right? And being honest with yourself about your own limitations and kind of that analogy I was giving you about the backpack is that only so much is going to fit in there and you can only carry so much before you're going to be weighed down to the point you can't move forward. And so it's a really about um, finding that balance of what is yours to carry and what is somebody else to carry. Um, knowing your limitations, knowing yourself um, is very important there. So I hope between the two of us, we've answered that question. And I hope Leslie gets to pop back on here, but I will move on to the next one. I blame my parents for a lot of my issues. They were terrible. I'm trying to get past this, but I had such a terrible childhood. How can I move forward so I can take responsibility for myself and not feel like such a victim? Uh, so I think this is a great question as well. And Leslie and I were talking just before we got on live here um, about an example of, you know, what if you really are a victim? Um, and she kind of drew the picture of, you know, what if somebody's texting and driving and they crash into you and they cause great damage to your car? What then? It is their fault and you really are a victim. But what's next in that? Um, what if they're not willing to take ownership? What if they don't have auto insurance? What if you're just left with a destroyed car? Um, and that's kind of, I think, what you're experiencing is that you really have been victimized. Um, but what can you do with that so that you don't live a life as a victim, um, but you can uh, fix your car, so to speak, and get back on the road, that you can take responsibility for yourself in um, getting yourself the help that you need to move forward. Uh, maybe that's counseling, maybe it's coaching, uh, maybe it's a greater support system, uh, 
perhaps having good relationships in your life can help. Um, but resting in that victim place of, you know, now somebody's destroyed my car and I can't get to work and I can't go anywhere anymore is not going to be effective. <laughs> just keep going, Susan. I'm just going to watch. Yes. <laughs> and I'll, I'll just tell you where I am. So I was a answering another question. I brought in that imagery that, that you and I talked about, about the car damage. What if somebody's texting and driving and they crash into your car? Um, because this person asked, how can I move forward so I can take responsibility for myself and not feel like a victim? So she maybe had terrible parents. And I know you experienced this, right? Some bad mm -hmm. parenting. Um, and you were left to, what am I going to do with that? Right? Am I going to be the same sort of parent? Mm -hmm. Or am I going to educate myself and, and be a better parent that I want to be and take care of myself? Right. And, and ultimately you know, who's responsible to make sure I'm healthy? It's me. Once I'm an adult, no one else is going to take that responsibility, even if someone else does the damage. So if someone, you know, throws a, is driving and, you know, hits me with a car and I have a broken leg, even if they're a benevolent person after they <clears throat> messed up and offer to pay for it, they can't fix my leg. Only I can fix my leg. Only I can go to the doctor. Only I can sit in intensive care and get my leg put in a cast. And only I can do the physical therapy to rehab my leg. I can't, they can't fix that for me. Only I can. And so I can just stay miserable and blame them for my miserable leg. Or I can say, yeah, this happened to me. And now it's my responsibility to make sure I can rehab my leg to the best of its ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And we don't like that, do we? No, <laughs> we don't. don't. We don't like that. It's not fair because we have this belief that life should be fair and good and easy and everybody should kumbaya together. And it's not that way at all. And how do we live in a world that's not the way we want? Yeah. And I have so much compassion for that, right? Living in a, in a, uh, with a family that was not good to you. It does have its effects, right? Mm -hmm. There is a brokenness that happens, um, but really you can either keep being broken or you can do what you can do to take care of yourself so that you can mm -hmm. move on to have a good life. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's the story after story is written about that from people who have survived horrible being in the Holocaust or being in a concentration camp or being in uh, you know, being a victim of a serial killer who grabs them and keeps them in a house for six years and rapes them repeatedly. And they have two children with this person. And Jamie Dugard's story is amazing of how she's recovered from that. But she had to take responsibility for that because it was her life and her healing and her future. And she wanted to have it. He robbed her past. She wasn't going to let him rob her present and future. She had to take ownership of that. But somebody asked if I could finish my thoughts on pride. I'm not sure where I left off other than Humility, pride isn't about, I mean, God's disdain for pride isn't about, oh my gosh, you know, I painted these paintings and I feel good about that. That's, that's good. Using your gifts for God's glory is a good thing, right? There, there's nothing bad about that. But when we're prideful, we're like thinking that we're better than we are. The Bible tells us in Romans 3, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought, but it also doesn't say you should think lowly of yourself. So don't think more highly of yourself. And so when we know our place, that's what humility is, knowing your place. Mm. You are a finite, limited, beautiful. You are God's most prized possession, it says in James 1. You are beautiful, a little lower than the angels God created us. But you're still lower than the angels. <laughs> you're still a finite, beautiful, and broken because of our sin, human being. And when you can accept that, like, I should be better than that. I should know more than that. Well, then that's the pride. Like, I refuse to accept who I am. I refuse to accept that. I want to be better than that. I want to know more. And that was, that was Adam and Eve's first problem, right? Is, hey, God isn't giving me everything I need. I want more. I want more. I don't want to just be limited to what God tells me I can do. I want more. That's that pride. I want more than what God has given me. God has given you everything you need inside your life. The brain that you have, the physical capacity you have, the intelligence you have, the looks you have. Those are all God gifts to you, God's gifts to you. And if you're mad that that's not enough, then that's an issue between you and God. But it's not humility of saying, hey, this is my place. 
I'm a finite, limited human being, and I don't know everything, and I can't do everything, and I can't fix everything, and I don't know how to fix your problem, and I don't have to take responsibility for your problem. I can care for you, but I don't have to, or I can care about you, but I don't have to take your problem and make it my problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. I was trying to finish your thought, but I just couldn't. So, yes, I'll read you the next question. Okay. I'm a little discombobulated with all the different. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, where's my stuff? All right, go ahead. <laughs> I know for me, taking blame gives me control. I can actually do something about it to change it. Of course, that doesn't work. And I just feel so terrible afterwards. How can I stop this reaction? I think there's a difference between taking blame and taking responsibility, right? So I think there is a, a piece of taking responsibility. So if I crash into someone's car because I'm texting, I am going to take responsibility. You know, I'm going to say, oh my gosh, you know, it's my fault because I was texting. How can I fix this in terms of your car, you know, your time off of work, your injuries, whatever. I can take responsibility for that. I can't make you do any of that. I can't make you, you know, I can't make you forgive me. I can't make you get your leg fixed. I can't make you even get your car fixed. I can just take responsibility saying I'm willing to to make restitution. But in the blame game, it's, you know, when you're taking all the blame, it's, it's sort of like you're not taking responsibility. You're taking ownership of all the fault at that, right? And most of the time, taking responsibility and taking blame might overlap a little bit, sometimes not at all. So, so if my husband blames me because he's unhappy, because I won't do a threesome or I won't... Um, have sex every night or whatever, I might take some responsibility of saying, nope, I don't like threesomes and that's against my moral code. And nope, I'm, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, interested in having relations six times a week. Um, And, you know, where does that leave us? I'm not responsible for your bitterness toward that or your unhappiness. So I can take responsibility for where I stand in something. Mm -hmm. I can't take responsibility for your unhappiness about that. Right. Mm -hmm. Because other people might think, good for you. You've got a good stand on that. I'm proud of you. I admire that kind of woman. Right. So I can't change his mindset about who I am. All I can do is take responsibility for who I am or what I stand for or what I've done or what I've not done. So, again, if I didn't do something my husband wanted me to do, I might say, oh, my gosh, I forgot to pick up your clothes from the cleaners. I'm so sorry. I can take responsibility for that. And if he blames me for having a miserable, I'm miserable all night because this, you know, you didn't pick up my clothes from the cleaners and it's all your fault that I'm miserable. I can't take responsibility for your misery, right? That's, that's your, that's your stuff to deal with that. However, life turns out just like the computer company was fixing our modem. That's why we went down again. My husband called and they can take responsibility for, Hey, there's a glitch at our end. But if I'm like flying off the handle, angry with them, they can't take responsibility for my temper right? Mm-hmm. That wasn't that. But if I was, and some people are, right? So so that I hope that explains the difference of, yeah, I might be responsible for some of the cause of the problem. I'm not responsible for your reaction to all of that. How you think, how you feel, or what you do. You're responsible for that. Yeah. And I might just ask you what happens when you're not in control what happens internally within you uh, that you're trying to resolve by staying in control and taking blame Mm -hmm. Um, that uncertainty of what another person's going to do or what's going to happen if you're not controlling it. There's maybe a fear in there that needs to be addressed as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. And I think maybe that's your own work to do instead of trying to control everything again, who controls everything? God, Mm -hmm. you aren't him. (laughs) Right. So accept that again, going back to humility of, hey, I can't control everything. And if I think I should, that's a pride problem. If I think I'm a bad person because I don't, that's a belief that you have that needs to be corrected because it's not true. Jesus didn't control Judas. Jesus didn't control the Pharisees. He didn't control even Peter. He warned Peter, Peter, you're going to do something stupid here. You're going to pay some stupid tax because you're going to betray me three times. And Peter said, who, me? I'm not going to do that. 
and Jesus didn't try to control Peter, so he didn't do it. He did it, and he paid the stupid tax, right? So, so what I'm saying is, is that Jesus teaches us not to feel like it's our responsibility to micromanage other people's stuff. And even Jesus didn't micromanage Judas or Peter when they, he knew they were going to do bad stuff. He just let them do it. Yeah, I love those stories. Absolutely. Yeah, and this is so important. And so in our webinar, we're going to talk a little bit about how do you do that? Like, how do you stay calm? How do you drop the rope? How do you know so that you're not in that tug of war? How do you get off the blame game? How do you take responsibility for what's yours to take responsibility for, which is you, right? I'm responsible for me. So I'm not, I'm not responsible for internet world. I can't do that. I'm not responsible to make sure all that happens, but I am responsible for how I handle it. I'm responsible for that, right? You got to see right there, you know, and thankfully this time I handled it pretty well. Other times I have not because I have learned. I let out here affect in here too much, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus says, I give you a unique peace. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. You know, he tells us, don't worry about tomorrow. I mean, he tells us, don't let the outside world rock your boat so much, whether it's in a relationship or internet world or traffic or weather. How many of you have ruined your day because it didn't turn out the way you wanted to weather-wise, right? And you're just mad. Why? Why would you let that ruin your whole day? You can't control the weather and you can't control another person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're speaking about moods ruining your day. So this next question has to do with that. I have to change that I blame others for my negative moods and process my emotions in a way that is God honoring and healthy for me and trying to define and navigate that. What's a good first step for me? Yeah, I think your first good step is recognizing yeah. that you're allowing life or other people to control you instead of you controlling you, right? You can control your mood. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something that I did yesterday that um, I was sharing with my sister, and it was just really very powerful. You know, and, and I'm practice, practicing these things in small things. I usually actually do better in big things. It's the kind of minor things in life that get the best of me sometimes. And so I'm trying to really be conscious of that, like internet going down or practicing things. But my husband and I didn't go to church yesterday. We watched church and TV because we love our church, CCB, and it's back in Phoenix. And so they have a service and we haven't found a church here in Prescott yet. So it's just, we've been a little lazy about that. And we haven't always been here on Sundays. So it's just easier to sit down and watch church, but they have communion every week. So we have our, our communion crackers and our little cups. And I was, I can't remember what I was doing, but I was busy right up until church started. And so I said to my husband, did you get the communion cups ready? And he said, oh no. So I had to go out in the garage and get the communion cups and get the crackers and I'm, and I'm having bad thoughts. Like, why didn't he get the communion cups? And why didn't he do this? And he's just sitting there watching TV. And I'm like, oh, blah, you know how we do it, right? And I'm getting in a bad mood. I'm getting in a bad mood because he didn't do what I thought he should do, right? Now, I don't have any control over what he does. And generally, he does mostly good things. But in that moment, I was like ruining my mood. And thankfully, I had the presence of mind to see myself doing that. And I pressed pause and I said, do I really want to go down that train? Mm -hmm. Do I really want to go down that path? I don't have to. I can be grateful that we can watch church on TV sometimes. I can be grateful that I have the legs to go get communion. I have the time to go get communion. I have the opportunity to have communion with the Lord this morning. And I changed my mood immediately when I switched the channel from grumbling and complaining about what I didn't have or what he didn't do that I thought he should do mm -hmm. to what was real. Right. And so this is the power of you taking responsibility for you instead of him having to do everything that I want him do, to do in order for me to be OK. Get the communion cups, turn on the TV, get the channel going so I can sit down and do that. I could do some of that. And it's not a big deal. And I didn't have to let it ruin that moment. And I have let small little things like that. Oh, you didn't make dinner yet. Why not? You know, I worked all day. Why not? You know, all these little things that can wreck your mood because life doesn't go the way you want it to. People don't do what you want them to do or what think that you think they should do. And let me just give you a, just a really healthy dose of reality. They aren't. They won't. People don't always do what you want them to do. Life doesn't always do what you. It's been raining here for the 30th straight day. 
30 days in a row in Arizona. <laughs> I left Pennsylvania so that I didn't have to be in a cold, wet, dreary climate. Now, it's sunny also, but this is called monsoon season. And I was talking to my neighbors here and I said, is this normal that it rains here every single day? They said, no, this is the worst it's ever been in like 15 years. But every day, like four hours from noon, best time of the day, from noon to five, pouring, <laughs> pouring. Um, I don't like that. Am I going to like that? <laughs> Am I going to move because I don't like the weather? No, I have a choice. I have a choice. I can't control the weather. Yeah. And I love that. The first step was that you noticed what was happening and you took responsibility for your mood and then you checked in with your thoughts. What are my thoughts telling me? And you made a switch to something uh, more true and more helpful and it changed your mood. Yeah. And it changed my mood. I didn't have to work at changing my mood. Yeah. What I had to work at is recognizing my mood, seeing what's causing my bad mood, not my husband. It was my thoughts about my husband. The weather doesn't cause my bad mood. Actually, my neighbors take the most beautiful pictures of lightning strikes in the clouds. They're beautiful because they're enjoying the weather. Right? <laughs> so it's not the weather that's causing my bad mood. It's my expectation that it shouldn't be this way. But it is this way. I have to accept reality. And that's what we teach you in this webinar. This workshop on Thursday will give you some of those tools on how do you accept what is when you don't like it? You know, how do you accept yeah, my husband's a cheater. He's been cheating and lying on me for years. I don't like it. He shouldn't be, he shouldn't, but he is. How do I live in reality and truth and not in what I think it should be like? This is a huge step in your growth and your maturity. And that's why we're doing these Facebook Lives so that we can invite you. Because, I mean, Susan and I have talked about this. All of my staff have talked about this. We want women not just to be safe from abuse. We want you to thrive in life. Yeah, absolutely. So here's another question. Uh, how do I let go of the rope when I'm afraid of no longer playing? I'm afraid the other person will fall. How should I move forward in this? Yeah. So you're telling yourself a story about if they fall. Mm -hmm. Because maybe they need to fall. Right? Because once you fall, then you realize, oh, my gosh, I have my own work to do. Right? I have my own work to do. She's been holding me up. Right. And so and so this is we'll talk a lot about this at the workshop on Thursday, because if this other person happens to be a spouse. When you are trying to make their life work or you are trying to manage their life, you're not allowing them to mature as God would call them to manage, just like a good mother. Most of you are probably watching here are mothers. A good mother doesn't keep wiping her kid's butt when the kid should be wiping their own butt. She doesn't keep feeding them with a spoon when they should be picking up their own spoon. She doesn't keep brushing their teeth when they should be taking over that responsibility for themselves, right? A good mom doesn't keep holding the rope for her kid and do his homework so that he doesn't get an F in his paper. She says, hey, if you didn't do your homework, you might have to fall down in school and realize that you don't get an A when you don't do your work, right? You might get an F. You might even have to repeat the grade, right? Mm -hmm. So that letting someone mature through their mistakes, through falling down. How does a little child walk? They walk by learning to fall down and get up, fall down and get up, fall down and get up, right? That's, and a good mother doesn't like put a little cage around her kid so she doesn't fall. She lets her fall because that's how you learn balance. That's how you learn where your butt is and where your hips are and where your shoulder should be and how to navigate one foot in front of the other. And you learn that through falling. And a good mother would never not let her kid do that to learn to walk and say, let's carry you. I don't want you to fall. Let me carry you. I don't want to put you. Let's put you in the stroller. I don't want you. To, you would you would be a psychotic, crazy mother if you did that. Right. So don't do that with your husband. And I'm not saying push him to make him fall. I'm just saying stop trying to manage his life and let him learn to manage his life. Mm -hmm. That's his job to do, not yours. Yeah. And if there's a fear of letting go and no longer playing, it may be, uh, and I see this with people, is that just having somebody on the other end of the rope feels like connection. Somebody's there, right? And so the fear of letting go is if I let go, we won't be connected anymore. Yeah. Right? So that might be a lie you're telling yourself as well. 
Well, there's two lies in that. It's true. You might not be connected anymore. So that, that scares you. So then what's the, what's the belief around that lie? So another belief, and I would encourage you to write this down and really think about it, is I need to be connected to him in order for me to be okay. That's why I keep holding under the rope. Really? Is that true? I'm not saying you might not want to be connected to someone, but do you need to? And when we need, I need, you know, my husband to do what I want, or I need him to be. I mean, we're getting older. One of us is going to die before the other, probably. Right? Am I going to die too then? No. No, I'm not. Or he's not. One of us is going to survive the other, and we're going to still live. I don't need him to be on the other side of the rope. Do you want that? Sure. Sure. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when we cling to something, Jonah 2.8 says, when we cling to worthless idols, and marriage can be an idol. A person can be an idol. They take the place of God in our life. I need this person to love me in order for me to be okay. What? Really? What if they don't love you then? People didn't love Jesus. He was okay. So those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. And so the bottom line, ladies, or the person who asked this question is, I would say, you need to put your relationship, whatever that is, parent, child, husband, wife, mother, you know, daughter, what, put it in its proper place. Mm -hmm. You have it as the first place in your heart. God calls that an idol. I will die if I don't have this person on the other end of the rope. Probably not. In fact, you might grow a whole lot more than you thought you would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I know we're running out of time, Leslie, so I'm going to go to another question because we've got a few more here. I don't know if we'll get to them all. I lived in a blaming relationship for almost 40 years, which included constant emotional and verbal abuse and sometimes physical abuse, possible signs of borderline. I finally left, but no one believes me because I'm a man. Any suggestions? You know, here would be the lie that you have. So I'm just going to address these lies because you're having a belief that I need other people to believe me in order for me to be validated. I need other people to see this in order for it to be true. You might not get that. Do you need them to believe you in order for you to be okay with your decision that I can't live like this and this was toxic for me and this is what I needed to do? Whether you believe me or not isn't the issue. People didn't believe Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think this is really crucial is that when we need, when you're saying, and I'm going to just write it out here in my little trusty board, and then I'm going to have to go because I have another meeting. Um, I need, okay, so I need, so your internal belief is I need something out here from somebody. I need them to love me. I need them to hold on to the rope. I need them to take care of me. I need them to take responsibility. I need them to honor me. I need them to treat me right. I need them to support me financially, whatever it is. I need them to believe me in order for me to be okay. This need is way too big, is way too big. I'm not saying we don't have small needs at times. Okay, I need a drink of water, whatever. But when I need this from someone else, in order for me to be okay in here, I need the weather to be okay. I need the computer to be okay. I need my kids to be okay. I need my husband to be okay. Or I'm going to be a wreck in here. I'm going to have a bad mood. I'm going to be anxious. I'm going to be scared. I'm going to be, God is saying, wait a minute. I have given you everything you need for life and godliness. Walk in that truth. Walk in that truth. These are all blessings sometimes. And they're also pains in the neck sometimes. <laughs> and all of it teaches us something. But God is saying, I have given you everything you need. I haven't given you everything you want, but I have given you everything you need. Walk in that. Walk in that. And so to this man, I would say, you know, if you have done the best you can to explain to certain people that mean something to you and they don't believe you, that tells you something. That tells you something. That the quality of this relationship may not be what you thought, not only with your wife, but with these friends, because most friends believe you when you're suffering. And they believe you when you say something. And so if they don't believe you, then maybe they're not the friends that you thought. And so why do you need these friends to believe you? Because they're not really friends because they don't believe you, right? So that's good data for you. It's painful. 
painful data, mm-hmm. just like your marriage information is painful data, but it's good data for you to make different decisions about your friends. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and once you settle on reality, then you can begin to move, move forward. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know if you can stay on if you want to, Susan, but I need to go. I have a 10 o'clock meeting, but I think you have a 10 o'clock meeting too. Um, I do, yes. Yeah, same meeting. <laughs> so we are going to have to go, but I would highly encourage you to go to this link at Leslie Vernick, where it says save your seat at the bottom of our screen, save your seat at lesliebernick.com forward slash join webinar forward slash join webinar. And we will see you there on Thursday. And I do think we have another Facebook live this week. I'm not sure where it is, when it is. Let me just see if I can get my calendar up real quick and see if it is tomorrow. We're going to do a Facebook live at nine o'clock Eastern time. No, nine o'clock my time, 12 o'clock Eastern time. If nothing changes in your marriage, What does moving forward look like for you? So this is, you know, nothing changes in your marriage. You can blame him or you can blame you, but you don't have to. What would moving forward look like for you? Mm -hmm. All right. So two of our coaches will be on Facebook Live in Conquer, and not in Conquer, in our Facebook page to um, talk about that. So if that's a topic that's interesting to you or of interest to you, please show up tomorrow at noon Eastern time. And don't forget, if you would like to invite a friend to sign up for our webinar, you are welcome to do that. All right. Take care. God bless. Thank you, Leslie. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.